As Britain emerged from the Napoleonic Wars and George IV finally became king, as well as the advancement in intellectual studies, it is reflected in the way in which Edinburgh was built up. The monuments and buildings erected were no longer concerned with or celebrated power and religion. It was now celebrating the intellectual values of a new enlightened era, and this ref was reflected in the erection of Carlton Hill. An observatory to embrace the new scientific findings, tombs to poets and philosophers, a monument for the dead to resemble the Parthenon in Athens, and a new intellectual centre for young adults. It was the famed and influential Scottish philosopher David Hume who in 1775 delivered a petition to the town council concerning the future use of the hill. It stated that a path should be made around Carlton Hill to make use of the views of the city, the Port of Leith, and the Firth of Forth, accessible to both visitors and residents alike. Not only would this walk provide pleasure and amusement for the people of Edinburgh, but it would also be good for their health. The petition was approved on the 26th of April, 1775, which laid the foundation for the network of paths still in use by the public today. However, this did not end David Hume's relationship with Carlton Hill, as when he died a little over a year later, he was interred at the burial ground, now on Waterloo Place. As a famed skeptic and atheist who held fast to his beliefs at the end, Hume was not a popular man and it has been said that his grave was guarded for eight days to deter religious fanatics from defacing it. The mausoleum over the grave was designed by Robert Adam and erected in 1777. It was said that the building was in a Greek style, however it reflected Adam's Italian influences being more like classical Roman tombs rather than the Greek style used on many of the later buildings on the hill. The monument erected was initially plain with Hume's name and born and died written in classical Latin above the entryway. In 1817, an urn for Jane Adler was added with the English replacing the Latin for born and died. And in 1841, a cross was placed upon a keystone and an engraving added saying, Behold, I come quickly. Thanks be to God, which give us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The cross was now removed but it appears that his family chose to add these in order to atone for his atheism, as Hume would not give up his beliefs on his dying bed. As a man of letters, David Hume had already left a lasting mark on the world, as his ideas on empiricism, skepticism, and naturalism continues to be studied to this day. There was an increase of interest in the sciences during the Enlightenment period, including astronomy. Thomas Short, brother of James Short, a mathematician and telescope maker, was allocated a plot of land on Carlton Hill in 1776 to build an observatory. It was funded by the University of Edinburgh and designed by architect James Cragg, who designed the first buildings in a style similar to Robert Adams with Gothic towers reflecting the castle on the opposite hill. Unfortunately, this observatory had to be scaled down due to a lack of funding, with only one tower completed where Short lived and ran the observatory until his death in 1788, with the rest of the work, including a separate, smaller observatory, completed by 1792. In 1807, the observatory was abandoned and reverted to the city of Edinburgh. It was only in 1811, when the Astronomical Institution of Edinburgh was founded, that funding was secured to build the neoclassical building that dominates the Edinburgh skyline today. Designed by William Playfair, it was the first of the buildings on Carlton Hill in the Greek Revival style, which reflects the idea of Athens of the North. The old observatory building was knocked down, leaving only the observatory house, and in 1822, during a visit from George IV, a royal charter was granted, making it a royal observatory. Completed in 1824, the engraving on the wall states, that a renowned city should no, not any longer lack the facilities for the pursuit of the fairest and grandest of sciences. However, again due to a lack of funding, the instruments were not installed until 1831, with funds running out in 1847, again ownership reverted to Edinburgh. The observatory continued to run but was mainly used as a time service, calculating accurate time through the monitoring of the transits of stars, which was highly important to mariners who set their chronometers to the clock at the observatory. It was this service which ties the observatory to the Nelson Monument as well as Edinburgh Castle.
Nelson Monument, built between 1807 and 1808 by Alexander Naismith, is a defining feature along Edinburgh's skyline. While the Enlightenment was going on in Edinburgh at this time, it was also embracing the unified title with England as the United Kingdom. This is reflected in the erection of the Nelson Monument, which was built to commemorate Lord Nelson, who died not long after the Napoleonic Wars of 1805. The way that Edinburgh citizens embrace the new unified identity is also reflected in the monument as they raise funds to express their gratitude for Lord Nelson. The monument also had a prominent place in the technological side of Edinburgh's history, sending messages across the city such as the time or the arrivals of boats in Leith Harbour. The time ball was established in 1853 so that mariners at the Port of Leith could set their chronometers to the observatory's true time at 1 o'clock without having to travel up Carlton Hill. It was the same technology that would be used to establish the 1 o'clock gun in 1861. This was mainly due to problems with inclement weather causing the ball not to be seen in Leith. The gun itself was fired using a telegraphic cable which stretched across the city from the observatory to the castle. A clock there would be triggered at 1, then the gun would fire at the same time the ball dropped. Prior to the introduction of the gun, it was announced in the Scotsman and a map showing the sound delay was produced with the delay to leave being 11 seconds, enabling all the city's residents to set their clocks to the sound. The Governor's House was built in 1815 to 1817 by Archibald Elliot, who is famous for his Greek revival creations. Elliot designed the building in a distinctive castellated fashion so that it matched the style of other structures in the area such as Robert Adams' debtor's jail of 1791, known as the Bridewell, and James Craig's old observatory on top of Carlton Hill. The governor's house, which was situated behind the jail, contained the committee room used by the commissioners who governed the prison. The jail received its first prisoners in 1817 and was prominent in the landscape at the time and was the largest prison in Scotland. The prison was constructed to replace the aging old toll booth on the High Street as Edinburgh's main correction facility, emphasizing the need for a larger jail as crime levels were escalating. Until 1864, public executions were still being carried out on top of the building, watched by crowds below as a form of entertainment. The jail itself was known to be a dire environment. However, the size and prominence of the jail emphasized the need for such a revolutionary correctional facility and reflects the discontent of society in Edinburgh as such a large jail was needed to maintain the order within society. Contradicting this, the ambitious plans for the National Monument created by architect William Playfair mimic the appearance of the Great Parthenon on the Athenian Acropolis. The building was to look exactly like the Parthenon, but inside would operate as a church with catacombs underneath. Prominent historical figures such as Sir Walter Scott, Lord Elgin, and Lord Coburn helped to promote the project and were key figures in the search for investors to raise the large sum of £42,000 required to complete the work. With only one third of the total funds collected, it was decided that work would begin on the structure in 1826. Installing each of the monument's 12 Doric columns was a huge challenge. Each section required the force of 12 horses and 70 men to haul the blocks of stone from out of Craigleith Quarry and up Carlton Hill, which was more than three miles away. However, the monument provided work for more than 300 men at its peak, in turn lowering unemployment in the capital. By 1829, with the western section of the monument beginning to take shape, it was announced that funds had dried up. With just the base and 12 columns complete, the project was abandoned, hence the name Edinburgh's Disgrace. Edinburgh in the 1820s was a city of rapid change as the town continued to sprawl outwards and was focusing on the creation of the new town, emphasizing the large-scale improvements that were happening in the city at the time in order to add to its appeal as the chief city of the north. The National Monument was just one of several large-scale civic construction projects going on at the time, and investors were simply stretched to the limit economically, and the elaborate Parthenon's replica's huge cost, estimated by some to be as high as £70,000, simply put off a lot of potential benefactors, therefore leading to its demise. 
The significance of the proposed plan to be a church also emphasizes the demise of religion during the Enlightenment as it was overtaken by the rise of rational thinking. Despite several attempts to revive the building work on the National Monument, it remains very much unfinished. As such, the monument is rarely referred by its official name and is widely known as Edinburgh's Disgrace. At one stage, Glasgow Council even offered to complete the monument as long as its coat of arms could be visible. Edinburgh declined, hence one of its other names, the Pride and the Poverty. The Royal High School was designed by Alexander Hamilton and erected between 1748 and 1756. It was built in a Greek Revival or neoclassical style of architecture and lies on the slopes of Carlton Hill. During this, the time that it was being built, Edinburgh was at the height of the Enlightenment, and this is reflected in its design. This was built to embrace the budding intellectual youth of Edinburgh and to show the, how the city was now an intellectual hub, much like the observatory at the top of the hill. The Dugald Stewart and Robert Burns monuments are linked by more than just location. Burns was introduced to Stewart through a mutual acquaintance, and it is interesting to note that both Stewart and another acquaintance of Burns, Sir John Whiteford, were members of an Edinburgh Freemasons Lodge. There is speculation that Burns was influenced by both individuals to come to Edinburgh. Burns subsequently joined the same lodge in February 1787, Lodge Canongate Kilwinnan, and many of its members were instrumental in promoting Burns's work. Richard Schur reminds us that a number of social clubs were flourishing from the late 18th century, as well as Freemasonry. These clubs were such as the Select Society and the Edinburgh Philosophical Society, later to become the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And these clubs in the early 19th century were a fraction of Edinburgh society still, a place where men could meet and discuss new topics, literature, architecture, and so on men of the Enlightenment, such as Stuart. Stuart died in 1828. He was Professor of Moral Philosophy at Edinburgh University for 42 years. His monument, which is a prominent position on the west side of the hill, was commissioned by the Royal Society of Edinburgh and was completed in 1831, some three years after his death. Designed by William Playfair, it is based on the choreographic monument of Lysocrates in Athens and formed a part of the Greek Revival, prominent in Edinburgh at the Times. Burns Monument too was of the Greek Revival designed this time by Thomas Hamilton. Burns died on the 21st of July 1796 and his monument was commissioned in 1819, so some time before Stuart's. The Political Martyrs Monument, also designed by Thomas Hamilton, is an obelisk that stands 27 meters tall in Old Carlton Hill Burial Ground. Joseph Hume, MP, a political reformer himself, advocated for a prominent monument to the Town Council of Edinburgh in 1837 on the basis that it would not interfere with the usefulness of the astronomical institution or with the aesthetics of the monuments already there. The monument is to the martyrs of 1793 who were charged with sedition. The men, Thomas Muir, Thomas Fish Palmer, William Skirving, Morris Margot and Joseph Gerald were all parliamentary reformers. The sentences they were given were exceptionally hard. 14 years transportation to the convict colony in Botany Bay. So hard, in fact, that even those present at the trial thought it was too egregious for the crimes committed. In Edinburgh, a council allowing them a spot on Carlton Hill. It could be that Edinburgh was showing how much more enlightened and civilized as a city of knowledge and culture it was compared to when the martyrs were sentenced 50 years previously. John Lowry speculates that Edinburgh, which was a leading light in the promotion of the Enlightenment, was setting itself out as a capital of culture. Lowry notes that the new town building was well in hand around the 1820s and there seems to have been some appetite for Edinburgh to become more of a modern Athens. What the monuments and buildings tell us about this period of Edinburgh's history is that Carlton Hill reflected the lofty ideas of the Enlightenment period, becoming a physical representation of the classical. Edinburgh's own acropolis, which provided public services as well as interacting with the city. It is a site of special interest where the public are free to walk thanks to David Hume and to discover Edinburgh as the Athens of the North.